Hi everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the Samantha Taylor podcast. My name is Shazrina and I'm the guest producer for this episode. So a little bit about me, I am a recent graduate from the Bahaus University's Bachelor of Commerce program with a major in accounting. In my last two years at Dal, I was given the absolute pleasure to study under Sam and then further work with her on various projects. Today we have Dr. KF and Dr. AC from the Bahaus University here to discuss organizational behavior. Together, they delve into the fascinating world of OB, unraveling its significance and how it intersects with the various disciplines in the Commerce and Management program, as well as its relevance in our everyday lives. But that's not it. They further discuss their experiences of teaching at DAL, its best and most challenging aspects. Um, they then talk about their hobbies, uh, podcasts and news recommendations, and some invaluable advice. So join the conversation and gain a deeper understanding of OB's impact on the world around us. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you want to reach out to either of the professors, their um, information is down below in the description. Welcome to the podcast, Anika Cloutier and Dana Cabot Farr. First of all, I've been practicing at home, and I know that there is uh, there are pictures. So, Anika, am I pr- pronouncing your name correctly? You are. Yes. Wonderful, because up until now, I kind of go back and forth either way, but something that you told me about how you introduced yourselves to your classroom uh, is you actually use, is it, what's the the word, like anagrams or use pictures, right? Yeah, yeah, I use pictures and sounds, and it's actually really embarrassing. I don't know why I do it, but I I haven't stopped, so... (laughs) Oh, no, it's perfect. In fact, like sometimes I forget to tell students, you know, um, like, hey, you can call me Sam or Prop Taylor or like give them a bunch of choices that I feel comfortable with. uh, Because if I don't set that stage, then they're kind of left like in this no person's land, like how am I supposed to address you? And by not doing that, I'm leaving them in a situation of uncertainty, which isn't fair to them. So how about you, Dana? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Yeah, you are. And so I do ask my students to call me either Dr. Cabot Farr, Cabot like rabbit, or Dr. KF, because I have a hyphenated last name, which is never that fun for anyone but yourself. So, no, that is actually, it's funny because I um, modeled one of my courses off of Dana's and I decided to have students or I at least requested students to call me Prof AC because of KF. And then I realized that Prof AC sounds like prophecy, which I love. (laughs) And so I'm probably going to do that also forever. Okay. Uh, Learning, growing, teaching, doing. Kate, wonderful. So now we know how to pronounce your names. Uh, I would love for each of you to introduce yourselves, your background, and what brought you to Dell. So uh, Dr. KF, let's start with you. Sure. So um, I got uh, all of, we always, as professors, we always start with our degrees. Mm -hmm. So I went to school at the University of Michigan because I'm from the United States. I grew up in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, right on the Canadian border of Sault Ste. Marie. And so, yeah, so I went to university in that state in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan uh, for all three of my degrees, my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD. And after I got my PhD, I went to the University of Nevada, Reno, where I was a professor there for four years before I made the move to Canada in 2016. And I came to Dal um, mainly because I have more opportunities to do research here, which I'm very focused on my research program. And also because my partner, Jason, is an academic as well. And we have lots of little universities here in the province. And so uh, we're always thinking about where his um, degree might be marketable. So that's like my professional background. And my personal background is I grew up on a ranch. Um, So I spent most of my childhood in the hay field uh, cutting hay for our buffalo. So I'm a farmer at heart and then a psychologist by training. And now I'm a professor in the business school. Love it. Thank you. Uh, And Dr. Cloutier, a little bit about yourself, your background and what brought you to Dow. Yeah. um, So I certainly did not grow up on a farm, though I would have dreamed to do that as a child. Um, So I grew up in Ottawa um, in a suburb (laughs) and was a pretty um, lackluster student, I would say, for most of my life until I got to university where I started to study psychology. And for some reason, 
really cared about it. <laughs> um, so I got really involved in university. Uh, I actually did my undergrad in psychology and applied language studies. And then I pursued um, my psychology master's degree at Carleton University. And then um, there I was studying romantic relationships. Uh, so I was doing research in social psychology, trying to understand uh, what leads to successful long-term relationships. Um, and I did a lot of fun little projects there, but actually I was on a podcast and I realized I had very little practical insight to offer the podcast host in terms of, you know, <laughs> what I could recommend based on my research. And I realized then that I, I wanted to do something with a little bit more of a practical focus that I thought could make an actual difference. So I started studying relationships in the workplace um, with a focus mostly on leadership, just a really important relationship that most of us will have uh, in the workplace, either as a leader or as a follower. So I did my PhD in organizational behavior um, at Queen's University, which eventually led me here. Um, and so, you know, Dana and I share a background in that we are psychologists by training hiding out in a business school. I am thrilled to be working uh, with both of you and in fact uh, getting to know each of you separately in my last few years here and then getting to drive up to you uh, with the management faculty, the faculty management retreat in, I believe it was November or the break. And that was nice. And being like, oh, this would be the perfect opportunity. In fact, I was like, I wish this was taped part of our conversation so I could listen back later or so I could share some tidbits with our students. So thank you so much for agreeing uh, to be on because I'm really excited. Also on that retreat and Dana, like, do not hate me, um, but I am so inspired by each of you. I... Dana received a research legacy award that was announced during that faculty retreat and that she had had to go back and be celebrated in front of the university. So like big kudos to you, Dana. And uh, Anika won a teaching award for 2022, a faculty management teaching award. So um, I just love this because I have like goosebumps right now because this really just shows me and hopefully shows our learners that you can be um, a decent, nice, like go for it, human being and kill in the workplace. So anyways, I'm so, so excited uh, to talk to each of you uh, today in case you can't tell. Okay, Anika, <laughs> as a follow-up, we know about your background, but I'm curious what courses, specifically like names of the courses, maybe some numbers, just in case students are like, huh, I want to take a course with Anika, uh, you know, AC in the future. So where could they maybe find you? Um, well, they have to take a course with me. Uh, so I'm actually just right now currently uh, teaching organizational behavior. So it's COM 2303. It's taken in the second year of students commerce degrees um, in the summer. So most of you would find me there. Um, I have taught in the MBA program, but I'm not teaching there in you know the next couple of years. So that's pretty much where you can find me in the classroom. Sounds good. And you say that students would have to take a course with you, but you know, maybe students might have to switch into the commerce program in order to take a course with you too. So you never know, you might be attracting some people to the commerce course and what better way to spend part of your summer, right? People talk about the calm summer for years to come. So I think that's a really special way to kind of make the most out of that. Okay, and Dana, uh, to you, where what are you teaching in the foreseeable future? Knowing that, I know you teach uh, in a lot of different courses or you have throughout your year. So where might people be expecting to find you in the next year or two? Yeah, so currently I'm teaching um, micro-organizational behavior in the management major. So management 2303, um, that's in the fall term of your second year usually. And then um, right now I'm teaching an off section of the calm version of OB. And so if you don't catch Anika in the summer, you could find me in the winter for an off section. That's special this year. Uh, next winter, I'll probably be back to teaching a micro organizational behavior seminar for our masters of science and business students. And so normally that is taken by um, Masters of Science and Business students majoring in management or 
opting for it as an elective um, if you're outside of the discipline. Uh, and that's a seminar type course. So small numbers, which is nice because normally I see 180 or so in the fall with our management uh, in the OB. And so I had seven last winter. So you really get some one-on-one -on -one time and get to know your students, which I enjoy. Yeah, completely. Sorry, and that the seminar one, that's an undergrad? No, that's the master's. Okay, project. okay, yes. I was like, woo, uh, yeah. I couldn't imagine. Um, yeah, having, I thought my small classes when I was an undergrad was like, I don't know, 60, you know, when you could, <laughs> when there's like no longer a good hiding space in the class. Okay, wonderful. So I have a confession to make. And that is Samantha, my main name, Samantha, uh, you know, of the undergrad, went to school for her BCom in accounting. And basically any course that was not accounting, this is my mental script. Why am I here? I shouldn't be here. I want to be an accountant. Okay. And this may or may not relate to some of our students. Um, and it's not that I like loved accounting, but I was like, practically speaking, I'm going to school for accounting. I'm going to school for business. Why do I have to have any of this other stuff? Um, and it's interesting because throughout my career, uh, it's all the other stuff that not only brought richness, that brought color, that I ended up pulling back. Uh, and I have very few fond memories from my actual accounting class. I do have some. Um, I have very little tangible stuff uh, because I later relearned it in the CA or CPA program. But what I do remember are the management you know, the organizational behavior, the leadership courses, the management courses that, you know, dropped in these little, little things at the time that really grew and blossomed and helped me become the professional uh, that I am today, you know, prior to coming to academia and, and still today. So my question, uh, and I'm going to go to you first, Dana, is I would like to know a little bit more about your discipline and specifically how your discipline contributes to other disciplines. So within management specifically, maybe accounting, finance, uh, you know, kind of the more technical ones, possibly, um, you know, marketing and supply chain management, and just really understand a bit more about what you do and how what you do can kind of contribute to people's careers, both now and in the future. Sure. That's a huge question. Sorry, I know. I know. As I kept going, I tried to give you like a little lead in time and then I just didn't shut up. Sorry. Um, I mean, uh, you will be hard pressed to find any person anywhere that doesn't work with people. And so we are talking about people in um, all of these courses that Anika and I teach. Um, and not only will you be working with people, but you yourself have to understand what motivates you and what you're looking for in your own job. And so kind of being reflective about what you want to achieve in life, what's going to be fulfilling, what are you looking for in a career? How do you want to behave in, in a workplace in order to be a good leader or be a good colleague? Or, and we're dealing with all of those topics. So personality, and we're thinking a lot about um, the ways in which, you know, people process other people. So our perceptions of others and our expectations of them and how those might be susceptible to bias and things like that. And so we really dive deep into thinking about both at the individual level and then how we interact with one another. And so, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, getting just drib driblets from, from your um, OB or management courses, that's exactly right. And, and that's what we hope that our non-management majors, uh, or I think we call it managing people and organizations as our major, um, <laughs> that, um, that those people would take something with them in order to think differently about how uh, they want to do their work and, and how they think about their jobs. And so a lot of, like my course is a lot of self-assessment, self-reflections, um, thinking about, uh, team experiences that you've had in the past, how could you improve, how you function as a team, how can you set that, set yourself up for success. Um, and so a lot of these things are transferable to your lives, whether you're in the undergrad program now, thinking about how you can transfer it to other coursework, but also then just post-graduation as well across disciplines. So it doesn't, we're all human. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And I, um, Anika, before I, you know, hear what you have to say on the subject, just interjecting my own experience a little bit, I started realizing, huh, there's like two ways in which to get ahead. And 
you know, I thought that that was always the goal. We can park that, but to get ahead. And one is, you know, you can rely on your technical skills and, and, or you can rely on your technical skills and have, you know, those quote, soft skills that people skills, and you can rise up kind of two different ways. And one, you have to be so good to stand on your technical skills and technical skills alone. And those people may or may not have the best relationships with other people. The other way, you can kind of do enough of enough and be good at your job from a technical aspect, but then also like get along and have a better time. And so when I really started thinking, what do I, what do I define as winning? What do I, how do I define like what I want to like do and how I want to impact people? That's when I started like pulling back and I'm like, oh, thank gosh, thank gosh, I was forced to do all this. And I have a very interesting perce uh, perception now when students come to me and say, oh, like yours is the only course I care about or yours is like the only one I want to do well in. I was like, listen. I want you to do well enough in my course. Obviously I'm biased, but like, please, like you are here, like get the most out of it. So thank you um, for kind of validating that it's the drips and jobs are okay. Um, Anika, uh, you know, I'd love to hear kind of your perception about how you see your discipline uh, contributes to others in our program. Yeah, I think Dana did an excellent job, of course, at capturing what organizational behavior is. I can give you maybe more of a, somewhat academic driven definition, um, but really it's just understanding how people think, feel, and behave in the workplace, which is useful for anyone and everybody. Um, one thing we also do a lot in our courses is teach evidence-based management, which just means that we can't rely only on our personal experience or our opinion to drive results or influence how we make decisions in the workplace. It's really important that we draw on other people's experiences, which you know we can call evidence, um, but there's a lot of different ways you can collect a whole host of people's experiences to inform maybe the best way or a better way to do something. Um, and so that's really what we're doing in class. We're, we're learning some theory, we're learning about research, but we're also learning how to put that into practice at a very personal capacity. And again, that would be beneficial to someone in finance, to someone in accounting, certainly to managers who are managing a team of people um, or just being a team member yourself, right? So learning why people think, feel, and behave the way that they do at work can really help you interfere and interject to influence the behaviors that you wanna see in the workplace. Yeah. One of the cool things that I heard um, from one of those students uh, that introduced your award, uh, Anika, she either said it during the ceremony or afterwards, but that the skills that she learned in your class helped her to actually um, apply it to group work during her undergrad, which I thought was so powerful because and people in their fourth year for strategy for the commerce program have a group project. It lasts all year round. All year is a large portion of your life, um, you know, for, for me, uh, let alone if I was 22 and what was standing between me and my degree was this group project. So learning how to manage others and manage myself and manage expectations and just have a better way to kind of come together in the short run is such a huge impact. Um, so yeah, for all that and then some, this, th these are like the skills that I'm like, man, I wish I could like go back in the past and, and do a couple of redos. Um, that being said, there's a lot of elements to each of yours jobs and positions that people may or may not know. For example, uh, us accounting profs realized that sometimes students, they think that our jobs are to go in, teach, and mark. You know, prepare to teach, teach, go home and mark. So um, for each of you here, you have a robust research, um, you know, focus and output equal to that um, of your teaching. And so they do feed back and forth. And on top of that, we have service commitments. So my question then to you, Anika, is what are the best and worst parts of the gig? Uh, and you can focus on the teaching, the research, the service, or perhaps maybe something that I have not, not even been able to encapsulate in that. Uh, okay, so for me, my favorite part of my job, um, I can identify pretty easily because it's what I normally leave for Friday. <laughs> it's the thing I wanna work on. Um, and so, I really enjoy working one-on-one -on -one with students um, and I take mentoring really seriously, uh, specifically on research projects. So um, I supervise 
honor students. I'm cross-listed with psychology at Dalhousie. So I have a um, couple honor students that I've worked with that are amazing and brilliant and really good people. Um, working with them gives me a lot of joy. Dana and I are co-supervising an MSc student who just got his data in. That's really exciting to me. That's something I like to work on. I look forward to it. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my favorite part of the job, which I think is a thing that a lot of students don't realize when they're in their undergraduate degree, especially within commerce. So there are options and opportunities to do independent reading studies with faculty members or kind of actually dive way deeper into a topic that interests you. Um, and so that's one thing I kind of talk about with students if they are more interested in a specific topic, it, it's always an option. Um, and then the thing I don't like about <laughs> the work that we do is there is a lot of rejection. So you have to develop pretty thick skin. Um, in research, you are constantly getting rejected. Um, you know, we have to apply for a lot of funding to do our research. That gets rejected. Um, and then in another, you know, very obvious way, students sometimes don't enjoy what we're doing in class. That can kind of feel like a rejection too. And so you have to manage the fact that, you know, you're getting very little positive feedback. You're getting a lot of constructive negative feedback, um, which I guess I don't like. <laughs> so that's that's the oh part of I struggle with a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and as a follow up to that, um, very relatable, and I think students, myself, um, you know, can relate to being rejected. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks on how to deal with that rejection? Asking for a friend, um, possibly myself, like this week, twice. Yeah, um, I think it's okay to feel the bad feelings associated with it and know they'll pass. Um, every feeling or emotion is uh, transitory. So you know that if it's a bad feeling, it's going to go. If it's a good feeling, it's probably going to go too. So I think um, being okay with living in that moment and knowing that there are future moments uh, is a good strategy there. Um, and, you know, finding people in your space as well, who you can relate to helps a lot. So if I get a rejection, I pretty much message Dana immediately to say, hey, I got a rejected paper or something of that nature. Uh, and it's just nice to know that you're certainly not alone in that. Not alone, have support. Oh, I love that. Dana, what's the best and worst part of your gig? I guess before I get there, let me just follow up a little bit on Anika's comment about rejection. And um, we do get a rejected a lot. So what we're talking about a lot here is from a research perspective of our one of our main achievements in in a scholarly sense is to publish in peer-reviewed journals and and the process is such that other professors other scholars are critiquing your work and the rejection rate is usually around 90 95 percent for some of these journals that we're applying to and so for me um a rejection just means that I went for it and I tried and I'm going to try again. Um, and I do believe in a game of numbers. <laughs> and so the more rejections you get just means you're getting closer to an acceptance. So that's about perseverance and resilience and like not letting it get you so bummed out. Like let it bum you out. Feel it in the moment. Like Aniga saying like, yes, like, but you've got to get back up on your feet and, and get for us a paper back out there, which like, who does that? But for other folks and students, like getting a bad score, bad mark on a paper, like feel that, um, but then become more determined into figuring out how you can be successful after that. Um, and usually that involves contacting your professor and having a conversation with them, which I think our students, our course sizes, our class sizes, especially in the courses that Anika and I teach can get quite big, 240, uh, maybe up to 300 even in the summer. And so it feels like, I think students feel like, why would she want to talk to me? I'm like one of 300. Well, you'd be surprised how much time I have waiting for you to come talk to me office hours or just time I have in my schedule that I could be, con you know, corresponding with you. I talked to a student today and I was just so thrilled. Um, you know, there's no issue yet, and, but he wants to be proactive in thinking about how he can do the best in the course. And so I was really heartened by that. 
Oh, All right. and just to, just to oh, yeah. pause you there, like the resilience and the rejection um, paired with the feeling, the feelings, knowing it'll pass. These are all so powerful, especially because you can look at people and say, wow, you're both so like, you know, established and you've done so much. But what people don't realize is like, listen, you're able to put on your CV, all of the things that you have done, but what they don't see, um, is this CV of all the things that you tried to get there. So it is a game of numbers. It is a game of perseverance. It is a game about like building yourself with the team, the best team available. And what you're saying right now is reach out to your props and have them be part of your team before, during, or after. Um, and like I have a student right now who failed a module twice. He's graduated and he wants to go for coffee tomorrow. And I'm like, I'm excited for that because I'm like, okay, like let's strategize. Um, and really let's like a listen and realize you're not alone. And we're all fighting these battles. And I'm just, I'm so honored. And he's likely somebody that took one of your classes and maybe there was a tidbit there that came back, right? It all comes full circle. So Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Dana. And okay, I'll, uh, now I want to hear the bad. I want to hear the good, bad, and the ugly, or just the, the bad and the good. <laughs> just yeah, the so I guess let me talk about the, the good just a little bit more. Um, for me, I really find fulfillment in applying like the expertise and the scholarly knowledge that I have of the, like, the scholarly um, evidence base of what we know about. So my research looks at sexual harassment, incivility, subtle forms of discrimination in the workplace. And so I spend a lot of time reading like really in-depth articles on that. But what I find really fulfilling is to be able to take that to organizations and help them digest that, understand how they can put some of that into practice, what they should be watching out for, trends that I see in the literature that they might not think is a problem in their workplace that they might want to pay attention to. Um, and so I find that really fulfilling and it motivates me past those rejection letters that I get. Um, in terms of the bad, um, I guess, I don't want to call it bad, but so as a professor, like, like Sam was saying, I think our students think that we're, you know, prepping our courses, teaching, and then, and then marking, but, uh, in my role, I, a big part is research, but then I also have a, a very substantial service load. And for that, um, I enjoy aspects of it because it gets me developing a skill set I am still working on um, in terms of managing resources of an organization, in terms of like lots of open lines of communication with groups that have diverse interests and as well as hiring. Um, so as an academic, you play a really big role in the human resources function of a university in terms of hiring your own colleagues in a collegial environment. And so I've been involved in that. And some of that is putting a lot of actually what we, what we teach in the classroom, putting that into practice. So it's not a bad thing, except that it, it's just a balance. It's all about time management, right? And so I, I'm drawn to my research. And so I, I'm just like learning to balance all those balls. And, and when you figure out um, the perfect and you've optimized it, please let the rest of us know because yeah, it definitely is challenging. <laughs> um, all right. So we may, we have definitely already done a number of this that is uh, looking at to speak to management learners and providing them advice. Uh, that said, without any constraints, Dana, again, going back to you, uh, what advice would you have for management learners? And you can put on any or no constraints um, as to the audience uh, or scope that you're talking to. Um, oh gosh, that is a big one. It, it's kind of what we talked about a little bit and is reaching out to your professors is a huge piece of this because we're really here to help and we have a lot of knowledge to share resources that we can point you in the direction of um, and so I feel like that's a really underutilized aspect of undergraduate education I was the same <laughs> when I went to undergrad I, I very rarely like cold called my professor about something right um, I went to a really large university where we would like talk to a TA before anyone else. But here at Dell, we wouldn't need to do that. Like our professors are more accessible than where I went. And so I'd encourage you to do that. Um, and then 
really view this time in your undergrad as an opportunity. We're all balancing a lot of balls. And so it might be extracurriculars or maybe a family obligations or your commute to school is really onerous. Um, but try as much as you can to view it as an opportunity for self-improvement because it, that's really what it is. And so, um, yeah, seize the day. Love it. And Nika, same question. Yeah, I think um, it's important to realize how fortunate you are to be in the position that you're in as a student here at Dalhousie. Um, a lot of people in this world would do a lot of bad things to be in that position. Um, and, you know, just even being in Canada, for example, is incredibly fortunate. So I think you have to take advantage of that and, um, you know, try and get something out of every course you take. So maybe you came to Dal just to be an accountant like Sam, which is great, but you have an opportunity to become a really interesting person by learning about diverse topics and being able to hold a conversation about those topics and actually have some knowledge to back it up. Um, a lot of the information we have access to now is in seven second segments, and that's actually you know, it's great, we can get a breadth of information that way, but we don't necessarily go in deep with everything that we learn about. And so that's an opportunity for you to learn about things you maybe wouldn't necessarily pick for 12 weeks, and then you can go beyond that as well. So uh, that would be my advice for management learners. I think that's perfect because it's a buffet, you know, you can, you're going to walk by, you're going to experience everything. Um, and you can choose to experience more of something and leaving those doors open because while I was had, you know, strong that I was going to be an accountant, um, I also didn't really know that there were other things out there as silly as it might sound. So, uh, when you see somebody approach them, ask them about their research. And what I'm very excited about is, we don't know who is listening to this, who might um, reach out um, to you, Dana, and learn more about instability and in research uh, in the workplace. And uh, Anika, we don't know who is looking and perhaps they thought, hey, I want to do romantic relationships. And then like, oh, there's parallels to the workplace and really strike up a conversation and it might go uh, one in multiple ways. So thank you for opening those eyes. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now because uh, we got a little heavy, heavy. And I know you are both rocking a good time outside of uh, here. I know this firsthand. I uh, firsthand evidence because of the management uh, faculty retreat. Don't worry, uh, Dana. I'm looking at you. Don't worry. I won't. I won't spill <laughs> any secrets. No, don't. Don't worry. Um, however, I do want to know, uh, Anika, you'll be going first, please. Uh, what do you for fun outside of work? Any hobbies? Any anything you do to get down and let your hair down? Yeah, so anyone who knows me knows that I take non-work life very seriously. So I think it's so important to have a balance. Um, again, that's that kind of interesting. Um, you're more interesting when you have hobbies outside of the workplace, I think. So um, what I do for fun, I spend a lot of time outdoors. I just purchased some property and we built a house, my partner and I. Uh, out of the city. And so our next big project for fun will just be building a homestead. So we are building out gardens. We're going to get some animals, some chickens, some goats, hopefully, and uh, really kind of invest in that other part of my life um, and, you know, grow our own food, live a little bit off the grid there. So that, that to me is really fun and exciting just to kind of be a little bit self-sustaining. Uh, and then I also love dogs. <laughs> So spending time with dogs. Yep, that's my past time. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's probably why um, I, I think we get along a lot. It's like a lot of common interests um, because, yeah, dogs, dogs are awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dana, how about you? Uh, where, where can we see you kind of um, pursuing your best life outside of the work? Well, I um, balance my work with my role as a mother. So I have a five-year-old daughter and um, she takes a lot of my time and energy and I enjoy giving that to her. Um, and so lots of time at playgrounds and <laughs> she's really into crafting. So when you hit five years old, you start to be more interesting, I think, than, <laughs> than a, a baby. And so uh, we love to do um, like 
she's into beading right now, which we're doing together or um, blanking on the name. It's not, oh shoot. The little pegs that you put in and they glow, not, you know. Is it light bright? Yes, yes. So I did this as a child. She's into it now. She's very detail oriented, just like her mama. And so we do that together. Um, and then just this, so I've always been big into dance. Um, and just this week, I have started going back to dance post pandemic, getting back to it, you know. And so I started to go to flamenco class with another colleague here. So that's been super fun. Um, and yeah, but getting outside, I mean, whenever there's a spark of sunshine, you can find me outside because I got spoiled living in Nevada with all the sun. And so now I'm <laughs> addicted to the, to the sun, but find myself in Nova Scotia. So it's true. I almost felt like yesterday when it wasn't raining, I'm like, I, I kind of tricked myself. I'm like, there's sun. <laughs> Just yes, there I, wasn't rain. The I was out. Rain was sun. I was out for a walk yesterday. It was nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, now I don't know this about either of you. Um, are there any books or podcasts that you're currently listening to or something that you revisit, uh, something that would either be applicable to management learners or just something that you love and find, uh, so enriching in your own life. And, um, I'll boomerang it back to you, Dana, if you have one on the tip of your tongue. Um, I, well, I love to keep up with the news. So I think that's really important um, as a, a citizen of the world to be informed about what's happening. And so I listen to the news every day, um, both being an American, both an American news source and a Canadian news source. Um, and I think that's really important to be able to have those intelligent conversations, to keep abreast at, you know, things that are happening in the world. And uh, yeah, so that's something that I'm committed to doing uh, every day. And then my students, hopefully they find a benefit, but I bring that into the classroom um, in order to think about how the changing, you know, um, workplace is affecting things or, you know, there's a lot out there about uh, post-pandemic um, life of workers, how they feel fulfilled, what they're looking for, all of that. Uh, try to bring it into the classroom to, to keep things current for students. So out of curiosity, as a follow-up, would we hear terms like quiet quitting? Uh, would we hear terms like um, hybrid workspaces? Would that be something that might come up in conversation? Yeah, for sure. My students just read a quiet quitting article last week and using it to think about, yeah, how our expectations and what we're looking for in work might have changed now that we've kind of gone through the pandemic. Um, and then, yeah, thinking a lot about, I still use a textbook and it is becoming increasingly more current, but textbooks often lag behind what's actually happening in the world. And so I augment that textbook with news articles and headlines and, and things to keep, keep um, you know, our students thinking about, for instance, when we're talking about ethical decision-making, I'm having them refer to current ethical decision issues and thinking about how their, their process would apply um, to thinking about, uh, you know, different things that organizations find themselves in. Oh my gosh, completely. And is there any uh, news outlet, like an app or anything that you use um, that's your go-to that maybe students could also use? Or is it, are you, you're just pulling from a number of sources? Yeah, I pull from a number. I read the New York Times. I listen to PBS NewsHour. So those are two American-centric and they watch the National. So mainstream news, um, but keeping it current. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And Anika, um, how about yourself? Any books or podcasts that you're listening to? Um, perhaps something that you would recommend to management learners? Sure, yeah. I'm an avid podcast listener. I love a good podcast. I'm walking all the time. So um, for me, I like to listen to something. Um, so I agree with Dana, stay informed. A 30 minute news NPR podcast is a great um, way to just stay informed and relevant. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are so many news podcasts to listen to. I guess my advice there would be try and pick one that's a little bit left-leaning and one that's a bit right-leaning just so that you actually gain 
uh, multiple perspectives and you can kind of see where you land on an issue. Um, to be honest, I listen to a lot of crime podcasts. I don't know why they terrify me the whole time, but I, I do. So that's not very helpful to our students. <laughs> but uh, oh, you'd be surprised. I had a previous guest um, who talked about their love of true crime. And they said that one of um, my former students reached out to them and, you know, shot them and they went back and forth about true crime podcasts. So like it's out there. It's popular. True crime is the number one category in podcasts. Um, I, I don't know what that says about people, and I, I should know maybe being an OB <laughs> person, but um, I think we like distraction. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of um, kind of OB or management related podcasts, there are actually quite a few out there. Um, Adam Grant, you probably have heard of him if you listen to anything kind of management e related. Uh, he's a pretty big name in our field. He has a podcast. Um, it was called Work Life, but I think he's changed the name to uh, Rethinking. Um, so that's an interesting one. I love Freakonomics. Um, just a great podcast. Again, they dive deeper into topics that um, are often quite uh, behavioral, which I think is just interesting to learn about people and workplaces and consequences of that. Um, Absolutely. And just to, just to interject there, when we say behavioral, it's almost like the numbers say one thing and how it should go from a logical point of view. And yet what people do and act goes counter to the numbers. So it has more of that behavioral element. Is that what you're kind of talking to? So it's kind of like that surprise, like, oh, we're doing this, but it's counter to what we may think will be happening. Yeah, I think counterintuitive findings often stick out, though. I do think that, um, especially in our field, people have this uh, idea that it's, you know, common knowledge what we talk about. Um, and that happens too a lot, right? So something you observe in your environment uh, might be a research finding we talk about in the classroom. Um, that's good if you're drawing that connection or if you think it's relatable or again, common sense. Um, because most of our work talks about the normal human experience, right? Mm -hmm. So what by normal, I mean average, kind of what centers in, in people's experiences across the population. Um, but yeah, there are always counterintuitive findings that emerge too, and those ones are a little bit more fun and interesting to teach. Fair, fair. Sorry, that's just when Freakonomics, whenever I hear it, it's always like they have like, they bring you down this like path, and then all of a sudden they're like, aha, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> and then it's a new way to work, look at the world. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're wrapping up. So last uh, little bit, uh, this is a question that I'd like to ask all my guests because it, it often varies. Uh, so Anika, I will be starting with you. Um, how would you, what is your definition of success? Okay. So a little insight, Sam sends her questions ahead of time to anyone on the podcast. And I saw this one and I got immediately nervous. And I don't know why, because I don't know, maybe success is just a very loaded word. Um, but I did think about it. And for me, um, success just means being happy with what you have, which I think is really, really hard sometimes because we are constantly bombarded with other people's achievements that make us want to have those same things. Um, and so, yeah, I think when you can find that, that balance uh, just in yourself and be happy with it, that would be success. Perfect. Thank you. And Dana, um, I'm interested to know uh, what is your definition of success? Understanding that sometimes to be the second or first person, uh, they both have difficulties in answering the question. So my apologies. Uh, Dana, how would you define success? <laughs> sure. So for me, success is having an impact on other people's lives. Um, and so that can look very different across different people. And that's why I think it works. Um, in my own mind, it helps me stay motivated and thinking about what I do in terms of my research and how that can positively impact others because I, my goal is to fight modern forms of discrimination, stereotypes and bias in order for all of us to be treated more equitably at work. And so that's really what tr gives me purpose. And if impact in that way would be to reduce those forms of discrimination, um, maltreatment and bias. And so that's what keeps me going. And 
so it can look, and what I love about that also is like, if you're not working in academia, you could find impact in other people's lives as well. And it just means that we're getting beyond ourselves in order to touch other people and make their lives better. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, so, so much, um, Anika Cloutier, Dana Kamafar, uh, Dr. KF, Dr. K, uh, AC, uh, for coming on. Um, if somebody, current down management learner, future, uh, never going to be a down management learner, would like to reach out, am I cool to link your Dow faculty uh, webpage below? And perhaps people could send you an email or find you on LinkedIn? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yes, definitely for email. LinkedIn, I'm not as linked in on LinkedIn, although I'm on it. <laughs> no, that's, that's good to know. So email might be the best way. Uh, read up a little bit more about your research interests. And if you find yourself in either one of their classrooms, you know, feel free to go up and say hello um, and connect because um, you inspire me as colleagues. Um, I am um, you are two of the reasons that make this, um, um, that help make my work environment, my space better. And for you to come on and support me and our learners in this way, I just want to say like, thank you so, so much. Thank you, Sam. It was so much fun. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. You're a, uh, you're a big reason we like this workplace too. <laughs> ah, okay. Ended it there. Cut. <laughs>